So yeah, without further ado, uh, I will introduce Fraser, who um, is a very product-focused guy at uh, Nickord. And um, yeah, come up there. Yeah, hi, Fraser. Thank you. Perfect. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. So I guess I'm the first speaker at this event. It's quite an honor and no pressure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Fraser. We, I work at uh, Nickord. I'm going to chat about building a, a minimalist SaaS company. Um, and a lot of time when people have these events and they, and they stand up and start talking to people, they start telling people about how, what you should be doing more of. This is going to be a talk about what you should be doing less of. Um, so I, I'm, I'm co-founder at Nickeld. I'm a digital product designer there. And what we do at Nickeld is we, uh, we help SaaS businesses like yourself. Uh, um, this is a quick GIF now that shows it. Uh, helping uh, SaaS companies onboard your onboard your users better. So we do that through creating interactive guides. Um, so it gives people uh, you can send out these guides to your new customers that you're onboarding, and it will show them how to get success from your product. It basically takes them through the oh fuck what is this product moment to uh, here's how we get success out of it. Um, so we've been running this for a few years now. There we go. There's the team of us. So we're a very very small team. We're a rounding error on someone like Stripe's accounting. Um, we haven't raised millions of pounds of funding. We haven't. Uh, we don't have hundreds of employees. But what we are is profitable, and what we are is uh, bootstrapped. And I think they're two terms that that don't really get talked about much when you're talking about SaaS companies. It's more uh, how do we get to the front page of TechCrunch after raising a new round? Um, and we've been able to achieve that through having a minimalist approach to our business. So in the uh, the first, so we go three years. In the first year, it was kind of a long arduous year, as with most businesses. And then year two, uh, things started to, well, no, year, th year two, things were bumpy as well. And then year three, things started to come together. And that's because after year two and the start of year three, we started uh, uh, really tackling the big problems we were facing and also um, cutting down on a lot of the excess that we found our business in. So let's first talk about a bit about what minimalism is. It's kind of a bit of a buzzword these days, but I think it's a good one to address. So if you've watched too much Grand Designs, you might be thinking about Minimalism is architecture with its clean, clean lines, uh, big glass windows, white walls, etc. Or maybe you're familiar with product design, uh, his uh, Apple's iPod, getting it down to the bare essential features. Uh, maybe you know Dieter Rams and his less but better philosophy in product design. Um, perhaps you know about, well, you've definitely heard about Google and it's one input to rule them all. Um, minimalism in a, in a UI design here. Or perhaps you're familiar with minimalism as a, as a lifestyle, you know, selling all your possessions to focus on, uh, focus on what's important, but maybe you'll live on a mattress on the floor type thing. Um, and minimalism often gets a, a, is kind of a misleading term. It's kind of unattractive. I mean, you probably all look at me now, right now like saying, Fraser, why do you want to, why, why do you want to, why should I minimize my business, right? Aren't we all here to chase excess? But, um, what minimalism, ugh. Minimalism is, at least for us, is about removing the excess to focus on what's important. So we've cut a lot out in the last few years. Um, and uh, so today I'm going to talk about these, these few things, cutting use cases, cutting features, and automating um, in our pursuit of, of running a minimalist business. So um, let's start with uh, cutting use cases. Uh, at the beginning, Nickel started uh, kind of three and a half years ago. We were working, well, David, the founder, was working for a... Uh, for a, for a startup in south of London called Gleanin, and they um, they had a problem with uh, product marketing, and they, they didn't know how to educate people around uh, around the new features, and they were really constrained there. So David went away and came up with a new a new product, a new prototype, and pitched that to the team, and they loved it. And then uh, three years on, they're still using our service. But the first use case there is product marketing. Then very quickly after, David did an, an event much like this and pitched to an audience, and then very um, uh, very soon after, well, a guy came up to him after the, after the talk and said, hey, uh, I like what you're doing. Maybe our customer support team will find this useful. So come in next week and chat to Gumtree. And then we managed to sign them up as a customer. So that was our first paying customer and quite a great logo to have on the website. And then use case three was employee training or partner training. So we signed up Hassle early on as well. Uh, Hassle is an uh, online marketplace for local cleaners. So if you need something cleaned, you can contact Hassle and they'll sort it out for you. Um, and they onboard literally hundreds of cleaners a month. And what, uh, what we do for them is we help them onboard those cleaners onto the, um, uh, the software that they produce, so like scheduling software and things like that. So um, after, so we've got product marketing, customer support, and employee training here as use cases. After the first year, 
we ended up with a bunch more. So here we've got customer education, product updates, SaaS onboarding, and sales demos. So it's a huge, it's a huge list. And then we also started looking at what industries we were working across as well. So we've got education, marketplaces, cleaning services, HVAC. Um, HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Hardly the sexy SaaS startup that we're trying to sell to, but uh, important nonetheless. Uh, advertising events and SaaS companies. Um, so we're feeling pretty smug at this point. We're working across all these use cases, all these industries. Um, we better get the Ferrari catalog out and we're going to make a bunch of money here, right? But no, as these things tend to go, um, it was actually a bit of a disaster. It was a product and marketing nightmare. Um, so just as well, we didn't put that down payment down. What's the, what's the problem with running multiple use cases? Um, well, it's kind of fivefold, really. Um, your product becomes super confused, right? You end up being, building this Frankenstein product to match all these different use cases. Your messaging is, is way out the window. So starting from the, the, the start of the website all the way through your app, if someone's coming in talking about user onboarding, you're going to be sending out emails about customer support, and there's a huge mismatch there. Advertising becomes more expensive. So if you're running ads on Google, for example, they, they assign you a quality ad score, and that's basically the match between your ad and your website. And if that's out of alignment, then they're, they're, you're going to get a low quality score, which they're going to charge a premium for displaying those ads. Um, expertise um, becomes broad, so we're having conversations with people across industries. Great. But um, I can talk to someone about HVAC and cleaner onboarding, but I can't go deep into, uh, their, into their problems. So that, that becomes a problem on the sales side. And then confuse KPIs. Um, people's businesses, you basically need to tell them that they're having success with your product. Um, and if you have multiple different uh, use cases, you're gonna, they have different KPIs for each of them. So if I'm saying how much time I'm saving you in support, that's going to be different from someone that's dealing with user onboarding, for example. So um, how, do we, how do we solve this? Well, we decided we needed a single use case. We needed to get rid of all the crap and then focus solely on a single use case. But this, this, comes, this is a nice strategy, but comes with its own problems. Um, which, which use case do you look at? So we started grabbing the data, and the data was uh, hugely complex as well. Um, we started interrogating it, but we got no answers here. So we thought, let's go grab more data. Um, and we started putting up landing pages and seeing what the market was, market was saying in terms of uh, which use cases get better, best sign up. Um, that didn't really work. So we started talking to customers. Focus here was how do we, or which, which use case are we solving the biggest pain point for? And uh, that didn't help either. So then we said, uh, let's pick a use case and experiment. And we'll run that for three months and then see what we, where we are at the end of it. So we set ourselves um, a forecast metric to be in, in three months on revenue. And uh, if we were below that, then we would revert back to where we were and then pick another, pick another use case to experiment on. Um, so, we, <laughs> so three months later, um, uh, that didn't help. <laughs> Uh, the reason being, well, it did help a lot, actually, but the, 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 the revenue was lower than we expected. Um, but we kept with it. So we're still using, doing user onboarding today. And uh, the reason w for that, uh, despite lower revenue, is that everything else became easier. All the conversations we had with customers became easier. Customers were more informed when they came in. Um, so really, we haven't looked back from going down this one single use case. And I think the business is much better for it now. So uh, maybe you guys are in a similar position. Maybe you're trying to sell multiple use cases, trying to fulfill multiple jobs. Um, maybe, maybe you should be uh, looking at a single use case and you don't realize you, you, you are at the moment. So ask yourself these questions. Uh, how many use cases is your SaaS being used for? What percentage of users are in the majority use case? Is supporting multiple use cases complicating your product? How many use cases is your marketing site trying to explain? This is a great question and a really quick a way of, of finding out if, you're, if you are trying to sell to multiple people or multiple use cases. Um, which use cases are we actually successful at? So talk to your customer success team. If you have one, they'll be able to answer this question. They're probably getting more requests, uh, headaches from certain, certain kinds of use case. OK, so that is um, about cutting, cutting use cases. The next thing was cutting features. Um, and this is obviously a contentious issue in most companies. Um, so here's a diagram I'm not very proud of. Um, I'm not proud of it for two reasons. The first one is that we're a nice company at Nickeld. Uh, we have a good relationship with our competitors, so I don't like to dramatize them as a emoji poo, but um, they got a cheap laugh, so we'll go with that. Uh, and I'm not proud of it for uh, the second reason, is that this was our sales funnel for a long time at Nickeld. Um, and we're right down the bottom, and there's a whole bunch of uh, areas that we don't control here. We don't control our competitors, we, don't, we didn't have much control over Google, we didn't have really that much control over Quora. Um, so let me explain what happened here. Um, Leads that would find Nickeld would go to our competitors. They start talking to them. They would maybe start a trial, and then um, uh, 
they were, for some reason they didn't like them. Uh, maybe it was pricing, maybe it was they didn't have a feature. So then they would go to Google and ask for an alternative, and then they would find Quora or Mashable, and then they would find us through there. Um, but as you can see, we're really far down the, down the pipeline there. A big problem with this is that when your leads go through a customer first, your customer, uh, sorry, through a competitor first, your competitor has already set a bunch of preloaded assumptions um, to that, to that, for that user. So they come in ask, are asking us for X, Y feature that we don't have, for example, because they've controlled that conversation to begin with. Um, so so uh, soon after that started happening, we had all these leads coming into us asking for a product that we didn't have. So um, to, to, to take a step back quickly, what Nickel does is we, we apply a uh, layer onto a website, but we, we apply that layer onto a replica version of the website. So we grab the HTML, the CSS, the images, pull that off the site, create a static site, and then apply a layer on top of that. Um, but what our competitors do is they apply that layer straight onto the website, and there's some problems you know, each approach, and there's a lot of advantages in, in our approach. Um, but these were asking for the first solution, and uh, we were offering the replica solution. But we think, uh, we, at this point, we're thinking, great, you know, we can go away and build what our competitors are building, and they're going to give us money because they're asking for that, right? So they're essentially giving us our product roadmap. So we went ahead and we built that, and customers started paying us for that. And very, very quickly, and I'm talking like two months, like a third of our revenue was coming from this new product that we just released, or this new, this, this new, uh, I don't want to call it product, but this new uh, way of creating a guide. And uh, that was great. Um, so once again, we get the Ferrari catalog out and we start celebrating that we're going to be rich very soon. Um, but you can see where this is going. Um, it was a bit of a car crash again. The reason being was, in this, in this example, um, it, was a, it was causing us a huge support pain. And our customers, for our competitors, suffer from this problem a lot in that if the website changes for one of those uh, guides, the guides end up breaking. Um, so this is kind of a fundamental problem with, the, with those products. And we ended up doing about 30 minutes per support request and one man day every week. And there was two of us at the time. So that's a huge, well, financial cost, but also opportunity cost. You know, what else could we have been working on at this time? And uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a big problem. Um, so we had two options. We either build our way out of it, we improve the product, make sure that the support requests aren't, aren't there anymore. Um, but the problem there would be that we would go against Nickel's ethos of creating a simple product and we would end up pushing a lot of this support stuff onto our, onto our customers themselves to fix, um, which we weren't happy with. And the second approach we could have done was axe the feature. So that's what we did. We axed it. Um, and we said goodbye to that, that third of revenue, but it was something which, uh, which really worked. Um, so ask yourself, uh, are specific features causing headaches? Your support team should be able to answer this. Are specific features complicating pricing? We were offering two levels of pricing depending on the product you were launching. Uh, the product customers were signing up for. And then what's the cost of building our way out of these problems? Maybe it's a small small cost so you can build out, but for us it was a big cost so we couldn't, couldn't really take that on. Um, so that's cutting uh, use cases, no cutting features. And then finally, automation. Um, so we automate everything that we can in Nickel. Um, it saves us so much time. I think we probably saved about definitely hiring someone in the amount of automation that we have in our business. Um, so here's a quote from an old boss. He said, the third time you do something, automate it. This was specifically around engineering more. But you can also take this across many, many, many areas of your business. Anywhere you have routine tasks, you can start automating. So to give you some examples there, if customers ask you questions three times, stick it in an FAQ or build a solution. Um, it's in the name, FAQ, frequently asked questions. Just put it in there and you won't be asked it a fourth time. Or you can uh, build a solution to it if the, if the cost isn't so high. If you need data three times, if you're running queries multiple times a day or multiple times a week, Stick that data on a dashboard. Um, someone from Gecko Board here, you can stick it in Gecko Board. We use, uh, we use uh, uh, Mode Analytics, um, which allows us to share SQL around the team, and uh, we can create wonderful dashboards with that. So chances are, if you need the data three times, someone else in the organization is as well, so that saves us a lot of effort. And then if you move data three times, connect services. So um, uh, the sales process in Nickel, we were transferring a lot of information between different SaaS products. But we've ended up connecting all those services with uh, two products, Zapier and if that then this, or if this then that, I'm not sure which way it goes. Um, and that's been, that's been really wonderful. So to give you a concrete example, if you, re if you request a demo on our website, that will, data will go into Pipedrive and then we'll transfer, uh, we'll send an email back to, that, back to that prospect through Calendly and they'll schedule the appointment. Then it will go back into Pipedrive and then it will go to GoToMeeting where it will schedule that in GoToMeeting and we'll put it in our calendars and in the customer calendar. So it's a, it's a really great system there. Um, so yeah, we've probably saved around, I reckon, 20 to 30 grand a year just from all those automations. 
And so ask yourself, uh, what are you doing regularly, three times or more? Which tasks do you despise doing? What are you putting off? And can any of this be automated? And if you can start automating everything, I think, um, I mean, it's a bit of a contentious issue right now with all the jobs to be automated, but um, it's saving us a lot of headaches. So uh, our journey for minimalism has been focused on one use case, cull features where you can, automate the third time. Um, so as I said at the beginning, most of these talks tell you about what you should be doing more of. Um, I'll leave you with this question. Um, what can you do less of? Right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fraser. Um, cheers. <laughs>